My name is Essie Mae Moody, also known as Annie Mae Moody, or Ann Moody. I was born on September 15, 1940. I spent most of my childhood in Centerville, Mississippi. A time and place with high tension between blacks and whites. That's what I'm going to tell you about. My experience is discovering the difference between blacks and whites in that time. One of my first memories in which I noticed the difference between blacks and whites was when Mama and Daddy worked on Mr. Carter's plantation. Most evenings, after the blacks had come from the fields, washed and eaten, they would sit on their porches, look up toward Mr. Carter's house, and talk. Sometimes, as we sat on our porch, Mama told me stories about what was going on in that big white house. She would point out all the brightly lit rooms, saying that old lady Carter was baking tea cakes in the kitchen. Mrs. Carter was reading in the living room. The children were studying upstairs, and Mr. Carter was sitting up counting all the money he made off blacks. I began to realize whites were more fortunate than I was. One day Uncle Ed took me to see Mama's brothers, Sam and Walter, and her sister Alberta. When I first saw two white boys, I asked where Sam and Walter were. Sam and Walter made me realize that blacks and whites could be in the same family, and even more surprising, Ed and Alberta treated them just like they treated me, and the white boy called Sam was nice to me, just like Ed. Sometimes Mama would bring us the white family's leftovers. It was the best food I had ever eaten. That was when I discovered that white folks ate different from us. Once, we ran into Katie and Bill at the movies and got in trouble for running into the white lobby. I never really thought of Katie and Bill as white before. Now, all of a sudden, they were white, and their whiteness made them better than me. Not only were they better than me because they were white, but everything they owned and everything connected with them was better than what was available to me. Their schools, homes, and streets were better than mine. Once, I asked Mama why Sam and Walter weren't white even though their daddy was white and they looked like Katie and Bill. Every time I tried to talk to Mama about white people, she got mad. Now I was more confused than before. If it wasn't the straight hair and the white skin that made you white, then what was it? I realized not all white people treated blacks like we were inferior when I worked for Mrs. Claiborne. She let me eat at her table every time I was there for a meal, and her and Mr. Claiborne started treating me like I was their own child. Sometimes I thought about how nice some white people were to me. Mrs. Claiborne was white, but she and Mr. Claiborne treated me like I was their own daughter. They were always giving me things and encouraging me to study hard and learn as much as I could. Mr. Johnson's mother, Miss Ola, had done the same. She taught me how to read when I was in school and helped me with my homework when my own mother was unable to do it. Then I began to think about Miss Pearl and Raymond's people and how they hated Mama for no reason at all than the fact that she was a couple shades darker. I had hated Raymond because Mama kept having babies for him and he never did anything for her. But then he offered to build a house for her. We'd moved six times since she and Daddy separated. Now she would have a place of her own, and we were going to be moving off of white people's places probably for good. When we moved in with Raymond and got to pick out furniture, I wanted a bed with tall posts and a cover on top, like Miss Ola had. Mama told me I shouldn't want everything white folks had. She said that Miss Ola's bed cost more than our house had cost. This supported my observation that white people always seem to have nicer things. When I worked for Linda Jean, I never thought about our color of difference when I was with her, except when she paid me. After Linda Jean, I worked for her mother, Mrs. Burke. She was very different from Linda Jean. She was one of the first of her type I had run into. She was one of the meanest white women in town. I tutored her son, Wayne, and she once asked me if I'd like to go to school with her son if schools are desegregated. I answered that I wouldn't mind because just like all blacks ain't like me, all white children I know ain't like Wayne. This made Mrs. Burke angry. Things began to escalate in Centerville as a series of crimes against blacks occurred. First, Emmett Till was killed because he got out of his place with a white woman. Next was my classmate Jerry. He was nearly beaten to death because he was accused of calling a white operator and threatening to molest her. Then the Taplin family's house was burned down with them inside. Then Samuel Quinn was murdered for attempting to bring ideas of the NAACP to Centerville. All of these events made me angry at both blacks and whites. Whites for committing these terrible crimes and blacks for not standing up against it. As long as nobody stood up to fight for equality, I knew there would always be this divide between blacks and whites, even if nobody could explain what it was that divided us. So I decided to be a part of that change, and I dedicated my life to helping close the gap and unify the people as one nation.